We've got five chairs. We fit them all up here. We, we could have had 10 and, and so many more of you. Um, Kimberly is going to start us off. Kimberly is the president and CEO of the Magnificent Mile Association. And, uh, and she's going to start us off with just a quick overview. And then we'll bring the panel up. And then I'll help uh, moderate a few, few questions, like I said, pre-submitted, and then, and then any others that you might have. So please welcome our, uh, from the Magnificent Mile Association, Kimberly Bears. Hello. Hello, everyone. It is great to see your smiling faces. Um, Dan and uh, Jackie and Omar and the folks here at City Club, can we give them another round of applause for everything that they do? <laughs> Dan, I just want you to pay attention to that. That was, OK, all right. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, City Club, for providing us the opportunity to be here. It's really fantastic to, uh, to have this this moment um, and this conversation. It has um, certainly been a long time coming, Dan, I will say. We've been approached by a number of people who want to see this be an annual event. We're open to that, so you can talk to our agents. We're open to that, just saying. Um, all right, well, uh, the Magnificent Mile Association has been at the heart of Chicago for 110 years. Our association was created uh, with Daniel Burnham's 1907 plan of Chicago. And at the time, uh, Michigan Avenue didn't, didn't exist. It was a one, uh, one lane dirt road called Pine Street. So just for a moment, think back to a one lane dirt road called Pine Street. That was Michigan Avenue. Um, with the opening of DuSable Bridge at Michigan Avenue, that heralded the development that we see today, and that's why so many of those iconic buildings have been celebrating their 100th anniversaries um, in the last several years. We represent nearly 500 members, and many of them are in the room. If I were to do, if I were to acknowledge all of them, we'd be done with our time. Um, but suffice to say, it includes folks like the Chicago Cubs, Loyola University, 360 Chicago, Northwestern University, Northwestern Hospital, Walgreens. Um, it's a very, very long list and a very prestigious list. Um, we represent uh, folks from all sectors. Uh, and that makes us, I think, fairly unique in the city of Chicago. We aren't a particular industry. We're all industries. So we have attractions and restaurants, of course, retail, property owners, um, and more. Um, and our district is quite large. While our name is the Magnificent Mile Association, sometimes that name is too small for the work that we do in the area that we represent. So if you think roughly um, all the way up to North Ave, Millennium Park, um, and west to the Chicago River, that's our area with 123,000 residents in it. Um, our story, of course, is one of uh, resolution and evolution. We've seen peaks and valleys, and like many times before, we stand in a pivotal moment, one of both challenges and, happily, opportunity. Um, when, uh, when, there's a, when there are a lot of challenges, when you're in a position like um, we have been, there is, of course, a lot of uh, opportunity ahead, and that's what we look forward to. Um, lest you think that we uh, have only rose-colored glasses or uh, are Pollyanna, we recognize, acknowledge that we have a lot of challenges. Um, perception of crime, work from home trends, and retail vacancies have given us, we would say, more than our share of challenges. Yet we very much believe we're experiencing a district on the rise with that growing residential population of 123 people, 100, sorry, 123,000. 123, <laughs> People, just 123 of us, 123,000, uh, across the Gold Coast, Streeterville, River North, River West, and of course, Michigan Avenue. We're seeing tourism rebound, and we continue to lay claim as the top tourist destination in the Midwest with 14.5 million visitors enjoying our museums, architecture, boat cruises, shopping, ticketed events, and more in 2023. Of course, we all know that uh, we had, we've had seven years in a row, is that right, Rich Gamble, Choose Chicago? Seven years a row, in a row as the best big city in America. Um, <clears throat> and, and we think we're a lot of, that, a lot of the reason that we're, that we're seven years in a row. Uh, with over 65% of all downtown Chicago of Chicago's hotel rooms in our district. So just for a second, 
Of all the hotel rooms that are in downtown Chicago, we have two thirds of them. What, how many is that? 24,000. 24,000 hotel rooms in our district alone. We're encouraged by growing hotel revenue, resulting in strong tax revenue for the city and the state. And of course, we have to Chicago and uh, enjoy Illinois in the room, talking about tourism dollars. Our district's impact extends beyond tourism and entertainment. And you know how uh, Gail Spring, uh, realtors say location, location, location. I have three different words for you. <laughs> All right, that's a little bonus for Gail. Um, three different words for you. Jobs, jobs, any guesses to the third word? It's jobs, it's jobs. So jobs, jobs, jobs. Why do I say that? Because one in five jobs that is in Chicago is in our district. 21% of the jobs that are in the city of Chicago are in our district. And those jobs are especially important for a variety of reasons. Number one, they're mostly in person. You, you, can't, you can't operate a hotel, a restaurant, an attraction, a retail store without being in person. So we're more back to work, less remote than any other neighborhood in the city of Chicago. We are in our district, in our offices, in our hotels, in our restaurants. These, ho these jobs too are, uh, can be um, entree jobs. So you can, you can come out of high school or with a G GED or just with a desire to train and move up through the ranks. So for a variety of reasons, our jobs matter. Um, we provide jobs for 75 out of 77 community areas in the, in the city of Chicago. Of course, we're hiring. <laughs> so if, we'll find out those two, dis, those two community areas and make sure that we represent all 77 shortly. Um, our impact on the economy can't be overstated. We generated a staggering 16.3 billion, with a B, billion dollars in consumer spend from 2019 to 2023. And that surpasses any other Chicago neighborhood by a remarkable six billion dollars. If you're not taking notes, I encourage you. I've got extra, I've got extra uh, pens in my, in my bag. Happily, positive media coverage and consumer sentiment are also on the rise outpacing negativity by a significant margin. And that's thanks to our focus on telling the whole story of our district like we're going to do today, as well as the work of many partners who share our commitment, passion, and dedication to making Chicago and the Magnificent Mile District shine. Some of those partners are here today. Alderman Hopkins, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your support, your partnership. Um, we have, of course, 18th District Commander Bars. Our, our relationship with CPD is strong. Um, we appreciate everything that, the, uh, that you and your team do in the district. And of course, we have uh, Chief of Police Leo Schmidt and Ro Khan from the Sheriff's Office. Um, incredible partners, and thank you for the additional resources that you've put in the district. Um, they, th the resources that we have make uh, um, a discernible and positive difference every day. All right, so as you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just the, the, uh, the hired gun, so to speak. I, my job is to tell you all the great things, but you don't have to take it from me. You can take it from the panelists. So I'm pleased to welcome up Nicole Benokin, Managing Director of 360 Chicago. Logan, and I think Dan, am I bringing them up now? Yeah. Or are you bringing them up? Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> Nicole Benokin. Uh, Logan, uh, oh, there we are, uh, from David Yerman. We're joined by Oscar from Starbucks. I don't know where everyone is seated. Uh, Stan, Stan Nitzberg from Mid America Realty. Right. And I think, I think that's it for me. Yeah. Once you get all situated, as they're getting situated, I'd, I could say that I forgot to, or I didn't recognize Rich Gamble because I knew Kimberly was going to, but just because <laughs> I flipped the page too You're early. You're lucky. You're welcome. Rich Gamble, welcome. heading to Chicago, that Rich has done so much for Chicago, and by the way, so much for the Mag Mile Association as a, as a past chair, uh, as we have Dan Russell here, past chair, and of course, Camille May. Um, three gentlemen who have done so much for the district and got carried away in my list of folks and, and didn't mean to miss anybody. Um, thank you all for being here. 
Um, so I'm excited to have this conversation. This is the most full we've had the stage um, <laughs> in a long time because there's so much to cover. Um, but really, at City Club, you know, we, we recognize that we have all these challenges, right? But we're really committed here to elevate the conversation, uh, not just admire the problems, but, but actually talk about solutions and best practices and, you know, real-time stories and successes. So we're going to hear uh, some more of that, and maybe some of these conversations can entice, um, you know, some future, you know, encourage future conversations and solutions. So uh, let's keep doing this to move Chicago forward. Um, we've seen the headlines. Um, we've seen vacant storefronts, right? There, that, that's all out there. Um, but what are we not seeing? What is beyond the headlines? Um, and Nicole, if, if maybe you could start us off, what's going on beyond the headlines on the Mag Mile? Sure. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I just want to first off thank everyone for being here. Uh, there are so many friendly faces and incredible Chicago boosters in this room. So thank you for taking time to have this important conversation. And I agree. I hope this is the first of many uh, and that we continue to advance this and uh, talk about uh, the, the great things that are happening in the district as well. Kimberly touched on a lot of them, Dan. Uh, but I, I think uh, for us, uh, you know, we are thrilled to share that foot traffic uh, is back. Uh, we have more than recovered to post uh, to 2019 attendance numbers. Um, so there are a few folks in the room that I'm not familiar with. My name's Nicole. I'm the managing director of 360 Chicago. We are the observation deck at the top of the former John Hancock Center. Yes, that is a mouthful. Um, <laughs> and I'm representing my amazing team who is here today. Uh, and we represent an organization that uh, purchased the observation deck about 10 years ago. In that 10 years, we've put $17 million of investment into our experience. If that is not a commitment and a sign of how bullish we are uh, for the district and the city, I don't know what is. Four million of that has gone in in the past two years alone. So we uh, unveiled Cloud Bar two years ago, and we are going to be ribbon cutting a $2 million concourse experience just next month. So we represent an ownership group that is optimistic and bullish on the city, and our numbers bear that out. Uh, so we are thrilled to talk about the fact that foot traffic is back, our attendance is recovered, uh, and our jobs support that as well. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about that when the time is right. Uh, but I want to also allow Kimberly to speak a little bit more about the, uh, the sentiment uh, numbers and, and some of the positive media that we've been able to garner in the, in the district recently. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. I'll just say that briefly. We started tracking um, sentiment, so a sentiment analysis through Meltwater, which is our social listening um, tool. And we've seen a, almost a 500% improvement in that um, from uh, last year alone. So uh, clearly, you know, we've never uh, lost what we'd say the, you know, the, the heart um, or the, the love from Chicago. We, we clearly have some work to do in terms of filling our storefronts. And you'll, you'll hear what our plans are for that. Um, but no, the sentiment is far improved. So let's, let's get to filling our storefronts. because it. Stands, stands next to Nicole here, uh, Stan Nitzberg <laughs> from Mid-America. And Stan, maybe if you, if you want to talk for a second about just your organization and what you actually do, but, but then perhaps get into uh, some of your thoughts and what you're seeing more recently uh, uh, in the real estate world and, and what's coming in and who is interested in the mile. Okay. Good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And pleasure to be up here with you all. So um, Mid-America, very simply, is a re retail real estate brokerage firm. We do, we like to touch, or we do touch everything there is to do in real estate relative to retail other than mortgage banking, 40-year-old company this year. Um, where to begin? It's, well, Stan, I, I grew I, up in, let, uh, let me just say, I grew okay. up in New York. My wife grew up in California. Been here 50 years. and. There's just really no other city, but particularly focused for this discussion, retail environment like we have in and around the back mile. There just isn't. Camille would say that we're one of the 10 great avenues of the world, and we still are. There's just no balance of you know, consumer, office, res residential, cultural, you know, universities in one place. There just isn't. And that's, that's what makes us really special. And that's what will allow us to test and stand against the test of time. Everything in life cycles. Just think about your own lives. It could be politics, it could be ties, it could be, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Everything in life cycles if you've been through life long enough. 
So in the late 1980s, everybody, every retailer wanted to be big. We all had all these small buildings, right? So those buildings came down, you built big buildings, right? And now we have these big spaces, and guess what? Retailers want to be smaller. And now we have all these big spaces, so how do you fill them? The beauty about w this country we live in and the city we're in is that, you know, retail, capitalism, everything that makes us great finds its own new level. And what we're finding now is how buildings and retailers are adapting to where the demand and supply is. And as Nicole's pointed out, I mean, the investments that uh, 360 or David Yurman or Starbucks or others have made in the city are just evidence of the fact that others are starting to rethink that Chicago is the place to be. And if you travel around the country, I just came back from LA yesterday, and you all have traveled, you know, every major urban city is going through the same issues. We're not alone there. We just have this really strong competitive advantage of who we are as a city, what it's like to do business here. And simply, the Mag Mile just has attributes that just cannot be competed against in that regard. So we're seeing behind the scenes more tours, more demand, more letters of intent coming through. Um, and if you allow me to re-speak, landlords are adjusting, tenants are adjusting, and we're going to find that balance. And I, I, I firmly believe that as we cycle through this, by 2026, 2027, you know, because it takes time, you know, uh, to get, go through the process, we will be back with full storefronts, new and exciting tenants. We've seen them. You see the investment Aritzia made. You see the investments most recently uh, that Allo has made, that H&M is rebuilding a whole new presence, uh, the EV taking over the Bandera, and just more and more stories like this. Or tenants who made the decision we don't want to leave, and this is really important, but we don't know quite what we want to be, and have done, for lack of a better term, those temporary stores. So the coaches, or the Hoka's coming, and others like that, who are in that adjustment period, again, between the balance between what space is there and what landlords would like to achieve, what tenants want to achieve. We all know we want to be here. We're just trying to find a way to do it, in a sense, buying some time to sort that out. Um, but it's just, I've had the pleasure, our company, to been working on the avenue for 31 years and been through a lot of cycles this way. And it really does feel as strong right now in a positive momentum than I've felt in the last four or five years. Because if you're, uh, one last thought. Retail was shifting before COVID. This was all happening prior to COVID just accelerated everything it did uh, relative to a lot of different industries. Uh, but it was coming. And so now we're starting to come back out from that kind of thought process. If you haven't read Stan's op-ed yeah. in Cranes from two weeks ago, I joked that we could just stand up here and read that, and our job would be done. We don't have to have. Uh, no, it's it's incredibly thoughtful uh, and a reflection of a lot of what Stan just shared. But uh, we were grateful to see it placed in cranes because we think that we need to see more uh, of that narrative included. So thank you, Stan, for working to get that placed. The biggest challenge we always face in many things in our own businesses is perception, right? What people think of you, what you think of the business, what you think of whatever. And our, our, I may be jumping ahead, but I, I, I personally, if you allow me to personalize it, view that our responsibility is to change the perception, one step at a time. Okay? Because the news is the news, and you deal with that, and again, every city does. We have that responsibility to educate and communicate with people just how great a place this is. Great, and, and you're not jumping in because we, we don't have an exact, well, I'm actually moving down the line in your, your, your comments about retail lead us right to Logan, because I'd, I'd like to hear now, you know, we've got the big picture. Why, why did David Yerman, I mean, the, the man and, and the, the company, um, why Chicago and, and why the Mag Mile? And what is your specific experience in, in that, what you've done most recently in the store? And, and maybe explain, so Logan is, is the uh, general I'm store, the store manager, manager for of David Yerman on Michigan Yerman. Avenue. Um, most recently, I worked for David Yerman in Atlanta and was promoted late last year. So while I'm the newest Chicago resident on <laughs> the panel, I'm very excited to be here. I'm from the Midwest, so very happy to be back in the Midwest. Very like-minded mentality. See, we are hiring. We are bringing yes. people yeah. to the city. Yeah. It's an example. We're and I live here. in Streeterville, so yeah. I, exactly. Right. <laughs> so, no. So David Yerman has been an American-made and kind of 
owned jewelry company based in New York. We've been in Chicago for 17 years. Uh, the first 10 years of its inception in the marketplace was on Oak Street. About seven years ago, they moved into the Palm Olive building next to the Drake because of its historic nature and just the history behind what our brand stands for. It's deep rooted in art, just like the architecture of the Palm Olive building, and they wanted to be a part of that amazing Walton North Michigan Avenue. Uh, architecture. So the Yermans are a huge presence within our organization. Um, it's David and Sybil. The wife is amazing. She's huh. kind of the business mastermind and he's the design mastermind, but he always makes jewelry for her. So that's how they got their start. Huh. And they still are very present co-CEOs. Their son is part of the business and they love Chicago. So they really loved investing in the Palm Olive building and it was Funny for him to even bring up speaking to Mr. Yerman about the location mm -hmm. when they made the move off of Oak. And we've like seen the exact same sentiment. Our traffic is up. People love coming to Chicago and spending their money here and just supporting the community. Great, and we'll, and we'll dig into a lot of that, I think, as we keep going. Um, Oscar, could you tell us about um, the roastery? And, and I have a couple ideas where the conversation can take us, but um, the old Crate and Barrel building that Stan is so, we're all so familiar with, and, and Camille, and um, an incredible investment in Chicago uh, that happened, what, just before the pandemic, really, and, and now is, is seemingly doing pretty well. Um, could you tell us about a bit about the roastery and, and, and also about your position there and, and what you've done over the years? Uh, hi, yeah, absolutely. Um, Oscar Gomez, I'm the uh, event specialist at the uh, Chicago Roastery. Um, Starbucks' history goes way back before um, the Chicago Roastery. We opened our first store uh, in 1987 on West Jackson Street, so not super far away from here. Um, but Chicago was the first city outside of uh, Seattle to get a Starbucks, so Chicago is very much um, the second home of, Seattle, um, of Starbucks. And so we love the city, uh, happy to invest and pour into it. The Chicago Roastery opened in uh, November 15th of 2019. So, you know, right before the world changed, uh, we opened to uh, innovation and experiences. Uh, we have the world's largest Starbucks in Chicago. Uh, and that says something, you know, a brand as uh, global as Starbucks. Wait, will you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> The world's largest Starbucks is in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty cool. And, uh, and we're very proud of it. Uh, this is where, where we want to go. Um, as mentioned, Chicago has just been this pinnacle of innovation uh, and really challenging what's possible. And we think as a company, our values very much uh, correlate with what Chicago is doing. Um, like I said, we opened in November 15th of 2019 um, to just lines of, I don't know if you all ever stood outside the line to get into the roastery, but uh, just, um, just really, really uh, Chicagoans loving Starbucks, loving the city, and loving what we're doing. Um, and we opened with uh, five floors. We have a cocktail bar. Um, we have seven different brew methods on our third floor. So really, really just uh, the cutting edge of what's next is as far as uh, coffee goes and experience. Um, but overwhelmingly, it's the, uh, it's the people. So we employ uh, over 200 uh, partners at our store, um, and that's just Starbucks. We also partner with United uh, Cleaning Services, Ally, Pinkerton. Um, so they all uh, have a part in making um, our space function and um, run smoothly. But um, it's the partners, it's the, uh, our employees who live in our communities uh, from the, the south side to the north side uh, that make up our population. So whenever you go into, this, uh, mm -hmm. into the world's largest Starbucks, sure, it's a, it's a big coffee company from Seattle, but uh, the Chicago Roastery is made possible by the, uh, by the members of our communities, and we're, we're very grateful to be here. Yeah. Can we stick with you for a minute? Because I was reading your bio, and you've been you, you've been with Starbucks for a while, right? In, in, in a few different positions. Can you tell us about your journey? Yo, yeah, for sure. Um, so I started off as a barista um, in, out there in Geneva, Illinois, uh, a long, long time ago, um, and then uh, left the company to try construction. These hands were not made for construction. So, uh, so moved to the city. Uh, I got a call from uh, Starbucks uh, shortly before I left my, my store in uh, Geneva. I put my name in the hat to be part of this big project. Completely forgot about it, and then 
as I was looking for a new store to call home, I got a call from the hiring manager to, uh, to come work at the roastery. Uh, I got hired on the spot as a barista, so I started off uh, making coffee, serving pastries uh, behind the counter, and then shortly after that, um, ops lead, uh, kind of like a shift supervisor, um, and then associate manager, and now event specialist. So um, I just think about like the opportunities um, you know that are within Starbucks, but also within the city, right? Like it was. Uh, leadership for within my store that uh, that really galvanized me to want to pursue the next best thing and really believed in me and wanted to uh, see me grow. And I think uh, that uh, is um, evident within the city as well. And just wanting our partners to just not see this as like, hey, I work at a coffee shop, but it's like, hey, I can actually make a career um, out of this place. And so it's been it's been quite the quite the journey uh, at the roastery. And I'm, I'm very proud to continue to be a partner uh, four years later. And thank you for I ask that specifically because I think that's such a great example of, and we've seen these examples, but of, of being able to come in to our country, to our city, um, at, a, at a somewhat entry level and work your way up, that's opportunity. These aren't just, these aren't minimum wage jobs, these are opportunities to, and, and I've seen that in hotels. I, we talked about Rich Gamble, his first job was a theater uh, uh, usher. By, at the water tower, and now he's he's running to Chicago, you know, <laughs> with like titles and president and CEO and all that in between. Like that's there; these are opportunities. I also love that you say partners. I don't know if that's a, a Starbucks. It's, it's very much a Starbucks thing. That's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. Our, our employees get uh, stock in the company, um, and so that's wow, we call them partners. Yeah. I see the faces at my table. Don't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I already explained to Oscar. I'm, we're loyal to each other, so Oscar, hands off. <laughs> Floating no Starbucks problem. stocks out there to everyone. But the fact <laughs> and the, I, you know, I, I think, I mean, Kimberly mentioned jobs. Oscar's told an amazing story. Sometimes we hear people ask why the health of Michigan Avenue or the district matters, and I think it boils down to that, right? So um, we're a small team, we're a small company, but in the 10 years we've been here, we've grown our workforce 52% by growing our business. In that time, we've grown our wages. Our starting wages have grown 55%, and our starting wages for our, our entry-level managers have grown 78% in 10 years. So we are creating paths towards really stable, well-paying, good jobs, and most of them stay in the city of Chicago. So my team, 90% of my team lives in Chicago, wow. and they live in 35 of the 50 wards. So. Our success matters to my team and to their families and to the children that they're raising. And I'm just a small example of the 500 members that the, Aven that the association has in the district that are all creating those paths towards stable employment um, and, and, and well-paying jobs that create futures for, for the citizens in the city. So I think that if, if, if there's one thing that the room takes away as to why the health of the district and the avenue matters to the city, it's those 20, one, in, one in five, 20% mm -hmm. of ev all jobs in the city of Chicago exist in our district. That's meaningful. And, yeah. and actually, that you didn't see my questions, but that, that, <laughs> it almost answers, but leads right into one of my questions, that there, there is and, and has been somewhat of a, a push and pull right between the neighborhoods and downtown. It's out there, right? It, it has been a push and pull, especially in the last couple of years. Um, but that's, that sort of dispels that push and pull, right? I mean, that's this mag mile is, is, and I guess it's not a question, because now I'm just restating what you, yeah. but the, the mag mile is the engine that's sort of supporting all these people who are then going and supporting all their families in the rest of the city, right? Well, I think the point is, it's not an either or, it's a both and. Um, so as we're up here, we are Chicagoans. Yeah. We're Chicagoans who make our living on the Mag Mile. We then take our money back to our neighborhoods just like other people do, and we spend it in our local stores. And, uh, you know, I mean, so you've got And you've hopefully got David Yerman also. Well, I hope to. Uh, I'll, have to I'll have to talk to Logan and see if there's a panelist discount. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Um, you know, I think that's exactly the point. So. So, the, you know, and I talked about that. I've, I've been with the Mag Mile Association for four years. I came in right before the pandemic. And in the interview process, I made clear that I had done community and economic development, consulting work and planning all over the city of Chicago. I spent 12 years with the fine folks at the Rogers Park Business Alliance. I've lived in multiple neighborhoods around, around the city. Um, woo woo, Rogers Park. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there, I, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. 
I don't know why this, this myth of divide exists. What's good for downtown can be good for the neighborhoods. What's good for the neighborhoods can be good for downtown. We, it, it, we, we should just get rid of this, um, this false division. Um, it doesn't serve any of us. Well, can, and, and the district is a neighborhood, right? You yeah. mentioned the 138? It, 100, well, there are 123,000. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, right, 123,000 residents. I'm an urban planner, so we do a lot of data work. Um, Denise Chetty on my team is also a huge data geek, so we've got numbers you know, coming out our ears. But um, to that end, in terms of um, you know, district spend, um, and looking at our district versus other neighborhoods. If we were a city, we would be the ninth largest in the state of Illinois. So if we were a city, if we were our own city, we'd be the ninth largest. I mean, that's how big we are. But for some reason, we don't, we're not thought of as a neighborhood. We're thought of as downtown. So somehow downtown doesn't count. Dan, if I may for a minute. So for the skeptics in the audience. <laughs> are there if, any? If you allow me to take it a little back to retail in the neighborhoods. So. Uh, folks would say, well, there are no empty storefronts in the West Loop. Go up south, you know, go up Southport. There's not an empty space on Southport, right? Um, you know, we have to be cognizant of the strength of some of the neighborhoods. Uh, but what will happen in those neighborhoods, too, is that, you know, the rents will get to a point and against the productivity where that'll cycle, too. Those, those streets have a, and those neighborhoods have every reason to exist. And there are tenants who decided during COVID they wanted to be closer to or straight up, we had no small space. So if you needed 2,000 feet and you want to be in Chicago, you went to the neighborhoods. Okay. That, will, that will evolve. There was a time, I think many of you will understand, when Oak Street had a lot of vacancy, right? So it's their turn in the last few years. This will all cycle. And as I said earlier, we're seeing that momentum of the cycle begin to shift as we balance between you know, the needs of the landlord, needs of the tenants, et cetera. But we don't ignore the competitive nature of some of the neighborhoods. But as you say, as a as community, you know, we're all in it to support Chicago. But there is a retail little uh, underlay to that conversation. So uh, Stan, if we could stick with you on, on retail, um, and just on innovation in general. I mean, Chicago is known for reinventing itself, you know, over history, and you talk about <laughs> cyclical, right? Yeah. Um, I think I know why you're laughing, but no, I was saying of the fire. I mean, of course, we <laughs> right, rebuilt right. ourselves. Um, but no, again and again. I mean, what what are some of the innovations that you're seeing as, as you're talking to tenants? What uh, what innovations are really going to be the next the next thing? Because we 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 should, I think, continue to push for. Um, using Michigan Avenue as a showcase for the next big thing, the next innovation. Uh, what are re and, and I, actually any of you could take this, but what is that next innovation? What is the experience? And everyone uses the word experience, experiential. Um, we talk about big stores, small stores. What's next? That is an AI. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was thinking as Carlos was talking, I'll maybe address it starting this way. It became a time again or it became a time when furniture wasn't, the Michigan Avenue wasn't the place to be for furniture. You know, the economics were changing, people's shopping patterns were changing, need for part, you can s come up with all the reasons. And so you watch a crate and barrel become a Starbucks reserve, okay? Change, innovation, different concept, uh, maybe just providing a whole different uh, avenue for uh, customers we serve here uh, at the time. I think you, we're just seeing, and experience is too widely used, but retailers adapting to make it more interesting. And interesting means different things to different people. I mean, if you go in the coach store, you can custom design a bag, right? Never would have thought of that under coach four or five years ago. And you're going to just see existing retailers and the new ones coming. They're not all going to be experienced illusion places and you know, come and see friends. It's just not where it's going. Those are filling temporary spaces. But every tenant in its own way is going to begin to evolve how it uses technology, how it presents itself, how it interacts with the customer, uh, and particularly, I think, moving back towards brick and mortar and doing it in brick and mortar, not in an internet kind of computer-based, you know, not experience. People want to touch and feel, I think, and will always remain that way. Uh, and AI is, 
who knows where AI will take us. I mean, we'll have to come back for a whole other discussion on that. Well, I think any of us who are not exposed to it, uh, and the little bit I am through a, a tech, uh, one degree of separation from someone who's in technology, is we have no real appreciation for what's going on. Uh, unless you're involved in it, unless you're an engineer, unless you grow up in that environment. And that's going to affect retail, I think, in a very positive way. Okay. Uh, Oscar or Logan, do you want to jump in on, on the innovation, or both of you, just what you're seeing and so, what you, you might so want to? So from a David Yerman perspective, because of our positioning as a company, and we had 40 stores going into the pandemic, we're coming out with 52. So we are actually on a big expansion, and we're opening up, I want to say, nine this year across the country. Because of that, people that purchase jewelry want to see it in person, but when you develop a relationship and have an experience of coming into like a flagship store, they really get to drive people back to Chicago or back to the community to see their salesperson or to visit the area again. While a lot of people that have never worked in the retail sector, <laughs> in the month of December, I worked 34 fiscal days of a 35-day month. <laughs> And we fulfilled about 680 online orders out of our store. So that is still revenue coming from our store that is affecting the bottom line of not only the company, but the community that we're in. Because each one of my ops teams gets paid additionally for that because the Yermans do that. But it just is an additional sector behind the scenes of technology because we had our best year fiscally as a company, but at our store level, but globally as well. I think going back a little bit to uh, brick and mortar, um, and I think uh, we all kind of crave human connection. You know, we we love being able to just be with someone who just knows our names. And I think uh, at the grocery, though, it's like the world's largest Starbucks uh, here in Chicago. But did they tell you to say that? So that got two more. Okay, I got two more. Uh, <laughs> but um, but we really crave human connection. I think at the world's largest Starbucks, you know, I think you know our. Oh my gosh, I did not mean to do that. No, but uh, we. Um, I'm sensing a sponsor for City Club <laughs> moving forward. I don't know. Um, but we, even with the stage that we have and recognizing that we can see anywhere from 2,000 to 4, River Dice coming, 10,000 people in a day uh, through our doors, um, that we really want to strive to make those connections, even though like you might be in a room full of 300 people. like It's, it's the effort of trying to get to know everyone uh, in those quick transactions that we have. Um, and that leads into our experiences. So Chicago, the Chicago Roastery leads the way in innovation too. Um, if anyone's ever wanted to learn how to make an espresso martini, you can do that at the Chicago Roastery. If you uh, <clears throat> want to get curious about how to brew a Chemex, you can also do that at the Chicago Roastery. So um, you know, we, we know things like AI, all that is coming, uh, but at the end of the day, like people will still need people, uh, and that the company was founded on that uh, knowledge that you, we crave uh, human connection, but we also crave it over something, so hence the coffee. So. Um, Howard Schultz famously said that uh, we are not in the coffee business uh, serving people, we're in the people business serving coffee, right? We, our whole basis is on people um, and the people within our communities and our space that make that difference and make that connection. So um, we're excited to keep innovating within the city but never really losing that face-to-face, -face, like, hey, here's your mocha, Mary, or you know, whoever that is. So um, we're excited to see what's next for the city of Chicago and to continue to partner with the city to uh, keep on growing. Great. Um, I'm going to weave in a few questions as I navigate some that, that are uh, coming in from the audience and, and elsewhere. Um, and just since we're on innovation, this one's close to my heart. I, Nancy, I can't read your last name. I think your pen was running out of ink. Hunt, Hunter? Um, Nancy asks, have you heard about flying cars? <laughs> she, I didn't plant this. Uh, no and, way. If, and if so, uh, what do you think we need to do to plan for them? Who wants to take ooh, that one? Ooh, ooh, ooh. All right, Kimberly. Mr. Cotter, need Mr. Cotter. Pick me, pick me. Um, Nancy, this is a perfect layup to some work that we started a couple of years ago that, that Dan and Nicole and Stan know well. It's called M Vision. Dan Russell, uh, former board chair, was chair of the board when we kicked this off. And this was our long range planning process uh, in which we developed these inspirational, aspirational renderings. Um, and uh, we've since seen some additional renderings from Gensler. Uh, ours were done with Lamar Johnson Collaborative. Gensler has also done some drawings. And there are indeed some flying cars in, uh, in those renderings. It is, it is looking forward. I think, I think partly what we're saying is we have, have 110 years under our belts. Um, and we've got another 110 years to go. Uh, we know that 110 years ago, 
uh, our forefathers, and I say that intentionally, didn't expect to see who, who would be leading the association. And for us to look forward another 110 years, I think to Stan's point with AI and other things, we need to be prepared. Um, so in terms of infrastructure, no, all of this, it's like, it's like quantum. You know, it's just theoretical at this point. Um, so flying cars, theoretical. But we are thinking about ways in which we modify, we adapt, we evolve the district, Michigan Avenue, so that it allows people to linger on the avenue um, while we have the world's largest Starbucks. That's now going to be the way I say it, too, Oscar. How many times is that? Is this like a drinking game? Um, it might be related to the espresso martinis, I'm just saying. Um, but you know, while we while we uh, while we innovate and while we evolve and adapt, um, we know that we need more opportunities for people to linger, for people to have a coffee, to have a um, uh, you know something to eat on the sidewalks. We need our. Uh, well, we'd love to see Jane Byrne Park um, receive some additional um, investment, a facelift, if you will. Um, so there are a lot of a lot of ideas that we have, and um, we're we're hoping to be able to make some of that real going forward. But it, it would be fair to say that transportation as a topic, mm. and having people move through urban environments, Chicago, you picked your city around the world, is going to become more and more important to maintaining the success of downtown or inner <coughs> urban environments whether it be flying cars or whether whatever it might be. So you just shut, shut down Michigan Avenue? Is that what? No, I've been through. Uh, Third rail. <laughs> I've been, I was around when State Street. <laughs> that was OK. All right, let's shift to, uh, to the arts for a minute. Uh, Julie is here from the Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, it's a long one, so I'll, I'll cut to the chase a little bit. But she's excited to hear about all the, all of the return to the 2019 traffic and all that. But arts and culture and inst cultural institutions have yet to see the post-pandemic level attendance, uh, revenue, and philanthropic investment. Um, MCA's programming is, has been relaunched with innovative, in the use of the word innovative, new programs as well. Uh, how can those of us in the room ensure investment in the preservation and growth of Mag Mile Arts? I'll I've got, think, I've oh, got go a ahead. quick idea. Excuse me, please, someone will no. speak. So there's always been movement uh, through, let's call them the low periods, of, OK, let's bring artists and stuff to storefronts. And that's very difficult. They're not institutional. They're individual. Somebody's got to overlay it. So I was just thinking about, wouldn't it be really cool, and I don't know how to pull this off yet, not personally, but generally, to engage the art and culture community you know, the big names who we don't think about, right? We're going to look for local artists and all that to come and be the backstop in the interim as we're rebalancing, you know, the storefronts and stuff. So why don't we engage with the Art Institute or MCA or just mm -hmm. go down an important list even through all the neighborhoods and where there's more credibility, there's more understanding of who and what they are and see if we can evolve bringing them out to the public as much as trying to draw the public into their buildings. Well, and in fact, we did that. If you remember the old Apple store during the, uh, it was in 2020, Nick Cave and his husband, um, Bob Faust, and they took Nick's work, which was then, um, so in fact, MCA sponsored, was a sponsor of that work because it took what Nick was doing internal inside the MCA's walls and put it on the, on the facade of the building. Um, this really fantastic experience of his work externally. And we have more of those activations coming. We have a partnership with the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, where uh, of their 35 metal sculptures uh, of butterflies, six foot by six, we'll have 10 up and down the avenue. Uh, and those will all be enhanced, decorated by local artists. So the Englewood Arts Collective, for example, will be at Jane Byrne Park. And, and another nine up and down uh, the avenue. But the, the arts is incredibly important. I would say arts and culture um, is a major driver. And I think you know Stan, Stan is right. We often think of that as the last piece instead of the first piece. So once everything is set, then we think to bring in arts and culture. And, and we've worked hard to do that differently um, to make arts and culture the foundation and the first work that we do. Stan um, was the brainchild behind a project that we did called Undercurrent, which is on the lower levels of Michigan Avenue. 
Um, and it was, a, it was our take on Leak Street, which is in London. If you haven't been there, I encourage you to check it out. It's phenomenal. Um, and so we took three artists and took their work and put it up as murals on Lower Michigan Avenue, recognizing that as we brought people back to Michigan Avenue, in terms of transportation, Lower Michigan Avenue isn't um, the, 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 the greatest space to be in, let's just say that. Um, but the, that kind of recognition of the work of arts um, and culture is key to, to what we do. We have a great working relationship with the MCA, the Art Institute. Looking Glass Theater is, um, they've got their gala on Thursday. Is it Thursday? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Um, so very happily, they're starting up with new productions, which is fantastic. Great. And, and I appreciate uh, that question, especially because that's what you know, City Club is trying to do is further these conversations. So what can the civic community, community do to be part of that? And I'll, I'll offer that City Club, you know, whether we have another conversation here or we do something a little bit smaller, but that's what we are able to do is convene these different entities from the different sectors. Uh, and, and we're happy to help continue that conversation of bringing the arts and philanthropy uh, together. And, and sort of in, in that spirit, um, I've, I've said a couple times the stage is only so big. We are missing five chairs. You know, I think I feel like we're we could only we can only have so many folks here, and we do plan to have more conversations. But but who th there's so much more to the mile uh, that are in the room. I see Jennifer here, Loyola's here. We have the higher ed. We have hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, could you maybe talk for a minute about Kimberly? I think I'll, I'll throw this to you. Uh, we were represented by retail and by real estate and, and by experience. Um, what are we missing that we all know and, and could be reminded of uh, that's on and near the mag mile? Well, for sure, um, hotels. So we, we don't have a hotelier uh, or hotelier. Um, I know there are two different ways to say that, tomato, tomato. Uh, we, we don't, but we certainly have them in the room. Susan Ellison, we see you, Peninsula. Um, yeah, I mean, we're very well, well represented in the association by hotels. We have all the top hotels in Chicago in our district. Um, and uh, certainly restaurants, we have uh, thousands of restaurants and bars. Some of the numbers that we pulled uh, also looked at the number of liquor licenses, and we have more than the city of Naperville or something like that, you know, just in our district. Um, so there are so many different folks. That's, the, again, the beauty of our association. Um, Dan Russell is one of four um, uh, boat companies, um, so all of the, all of the boat operators are members of our association. The Chicago Riverwalk, I mean, the list really does, it goes on and on very happily. Dan, if I could jump yeah, in real quick. Um, Daniel Thomas and I were talking about this just before we started. Uh, and I, I think you, uh, just to your point on sort of participation, cooperation, I've never seen a moment in, in the 20 years I've been in the district where leadership is working in the same direction, supporting each other. There's so much cooperation from the state, from Choose Chicago, at the Mag Mile, from our elected officials, from our incredible uh, partners in, in law enforcement as well. And I think that that is one of our strengths in this district, is that there's so much interest in supporting each other, amplifying message. Uh, I, there's a great uh, Mag Mile Association website being launched that Denise and Susan have been working on for a while. That's a great opportunity. The team at MCA is a great partner of ours. We love having conversations about how to extend audience, right? So, so if, if our uh, foot traffic is back and other, or other organizations are not, how can we figure out how to leverage and parlay our audience into helping to extend the visit and, and, and prolong the time that that guest is spending in the district? And it's part of what makes us so enthusiastic and optimistic about the future is that uh, all those leaders and all those organizations are genuinely working together um, and supporting each other to advance that vision and, and to work towards a, a really uh, phenomenal future. Yeah, I'll echo that. We, uh, Karen Hickey and I had a membership conversation with a um, potential member. And he said he'd been at a, at a meeting, and he had heard Rich and, I don't think, Daniel, you were there, but it was Rich and somebody else speaking. And uh, he said, well, you know, what you're saying is exactly what I just heard Chu Chicago say. And I said, well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> because, it, because it underscores um, in a very real way what Nicole is saying. I mean, the partnerships, and I, and I would say there are a couple things that I would hope people would take away from the, the panel. Um, certainly what we're talking about in terms of 
uh, Michigan Avenue and downtown and the importance of both and how it contributes to the fabric of uh, what we know and love, but the very real people that are behind the story. Um, so you're hearing real people's stories here um, and getting a sense of the people that are behind the operations. And then, um, as Nicole said, the incredible collaboration. There, uh, I mean, before this, Daniel, I mean, Daniel Thomas has been in India, Australia, New Zealand, um, I, Mexico. I can't even remember where I'm, I'm forgetting, a, a, you know, bunches, I'm sure. Um, and Daniel came here early so that we could have a conversation about a, a product they're, they're launching called Lux. And that's a focus on luxury. Um, not only are they, are they doing every other thing about outside and downstate and upstate and this state and that state, um, uh, Illinois made, whatnot, but also luxury. Um, so the, the partnership that we have with all of those folks is, um, and we couldn't do it. I mean, Nicole is talking about her small team. I've got, I think, the best team ever that we've had at the Mag Mile. We're 10. Um, so the way that we do everything is through all of you. And, and speaking of partnerships, and we, I, like I said, we love keeping the conversation positive, and, and there is that perception. I, it's inspiring that we have two representatives from Chicago Police Department here, uh, or three, four, really, when you, when you get the county involved. Um, there's no doubt we've had issues. We've had smash and grabs. We've had, um, you know, various, all sorts of issues over the years. Um, it, it's, it's great to see you all in the room as part of the conversation. Um, does anyone here want to speak to that and, and how that's seemingly, hopefully, getting better? Um, because it is an issue for a lot of people that, that maybe are avoiding the mag mile still. Yeah, I, I certainly can, and, and then, I mean, I, we've, we have this conversation all the time. That the two top priorities for the association are safety and security, number one, and then storefront vacancies, number two. I mean, so those are our two priorities. Um, and for a long time, for several years, we only had one priority, and it was safety and security. But we created a special service area on Michigan Avenue. It was a fast track. We did it in the previous administration. We had a three-year term. We're coming up to the end of those three years. and with the support of Alderman Hopkins, Alderman Riley, and our state elected officials. I see State Rep uh, Kim Dubuclé here. Thank you very much for being here. Um, of course, Senator Peters. We've got legislation in Springfield right now that would help us create what's called the Business Improvement District. And we think for our district, that's really the right economic tool. Um, and that's sponsored by our state senator, Sarah Feigenholz, and our state rep, Cam Buckner. Um, the, the, um, the SSA, as it, as it exists today, and John Gagliardo is here. He's a commissioner on the SSA, John. Um, uh, the SSA spends about half its, its um, uh, allotment on safety and security initiatives. So we have additional foot patrols that are sworn officers, and then we have overnight patrol. And this is in addition to the very fine work that we have from um, the folks in the 18th district and um, from the Cook County Sheriff's Office. We, uh, I think a lot of po folks know that there was uh, what's called a strategic deployment initiative on Michigan Avenue. You saw the cars and the medians with the, the blue lights flashing. It's called an SDI for short. Uh, and Superintendent Larry Snelling looked at that, realized it was costing a lot of money. It wasn't really what we had wanted anyway. And I used this very royal we had making a lot of eye contact with Alderman Hopkins now, um, who's the uh, chair of the Committee on Public Safety for the city of Chicago. Um, so we now are really lucky that we have 30, about 30 additional officers um, that are on the avenue. And in fact, I was able to interact with them yesterday. I was leaving one meeting, going to another. And they were right there um, walking up and down the avenue, making sure that people are safe, feel safe, dealing with any kinds of issues that were there. I say all of that because we're, we're mindful of the perception and the reality, and we're working on both of those. I mean, I think your point, Dan, we don't talk about problems. We're here to, you know, we're not here to whine about problems. I don't get paid to complain. I get paid to pro proactively solve, um, solve problems and, and be a, uh, you know, somebody that's solution-oriented. Um, so with the help of the SSA and our great partners in the room, we are making incredible strides. Great. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I was just going to say really quick, um, safety and security, is, it's very important to Starbucks, and I think we have the- um, World's largest Starbucks. There we go. Now we're going to mission accomplished. Um, but uh, we have, this, obviously, this opportunity to be on the, uh, on the Mac Mile, um, and, you know, our, uh, the folks at the Chicago Police Department, District 1, um, 
they have just been so um, so pivotal in just that relationship. They, they came to us uh, wanting to just make sure to ask us what it is that we need, how we felt. And um, I think it's, it's one thing, you know, you can't always control what's happening outside of your storefront, but just to know that there's a willingness, uh, not just a willingness, but there, there's an eagerness to like form connections uh, within, uh, within retail spaces to um, the police department. Uh, it's just been fantastic for us. Um, our leadership is very thankful to the Chicago Police Department, uh, District 1, for uh, their, just, their continued support uh, through everything that we've been through. So um, that, that's what I want. All right. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're closing in here, uh, actually a couple minutes over, but uh, Logan, you mentioned, how many stores does David German have again? So uh, across the globe, 52, we have 48 okay. in the North American And market. do you get together with your other uh, cohorts, uh, your, your other So stores all of us or? get in, together in, under one roof once a year, but actually I'm on the help out committee. So if somebody goes on vacation or if you have some sickness, I actually f fly to other stores to help out oh. for a period of time. So this year so far, I've been to Atlanta, Palm Beach, Detroit, and Denver. Okay. And what I'm, what I'm getting at here is if you were to talk to your What's going on back there? But um, improvements being made to Magianos. Yeah. <laughs> Investment. Um, if if you were to have a conversation with some of uh, of your colleagues in the different cities about Chicago, uh, what would you maybe have, or, or maybe you will? What would you tell them in the most recent times? That they probably wish that their store was as good as ours. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, that we have such a a great traffic pattern through the city and people want to come spend their money with us. And it's crazy because, and I was talking to somebody earlier about this, I'm in the middle of a project called Retail Excellence where all retail leaders in our company have to go through this process where you get to deep dive your last year's numbers. Our store only had 4,500 people in the, in like the entire month and we blew our goal away. I can't say it publicly, <laughs> but for example- We love making news here though. So we had 4,500 people in in 30 days and Detroit had 10,000 and we still sold more than them. Huh. Great. So we had, great. they had twice as many and we still sold more. So- All right, mm -hmm. All right. any they know. great news that we want to end on? I think I let off with our investment. No, I, so that question though, I, I, and Caitlin, I, I was making eye contact with you. We hosted the World Federation of Great Towers there's an association for everything. <laughs> Their North American meeting in October. So we had in the room the Empire State Building, the, uh, the Space Needle from Seattle, CN Tower from Toronto, all over uh, North America. There were about 10, 12 towers represented, 15, 20 people. To a point, every one of them said, wow, your city is beautiful, it's clean, I feel safe. I wish our city had recovered the way yours had. This is coming from New York, from the Empire Everybody's State Building Everybody's listening team. to this, right? <laughs> All the press is dialed. From <laughs> the Space Needle. I mean, from these iconic teams in these iconic cities, and to a point, unsolicited, they all provided that feedback to us. They were blown away by the way the city presented itself, how friendly it was, how clean it was, how safe downtown felt. So I think sometimes, and, and, and there was a, a Cranes article this morning, and it was a couple of different marketing professionals talking about what the city could do to, to continue to work towards rebranding, which I know Rich is working on. And one of them said Chicago tends to be too humble, and I do think we, we sometimes risk getting in our own little echo chamber. That is not to negate the, 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 the challenges that we have, uh, but I think sometimes we, um, we lose perspective, right? And, and it was really gratifying to hear unsolicited a lot of people that come from incredible cities and work in tourism tell us how, how evident our strengths were to them. Great, that's great to hear. I, we could do this all day. Um, I know you all have plenty more thoughts, but I have to cut this off because, uh, <laughs> which is great because it means we'll have to do it again, right? Yay! And um, we all uh, we all are busy. There's still plenty of work to do, so you all need to get back to work. But good to stop for a minute and or an hour and and realize all the good that is happening and and so much more that's that's to come. Uh, we didn't get to everybody's questions. I know uh, Laura Schwartz had one, but I I think Stan. Uh, answered part of it. Uh, there's a question about the DNC and what we're doing. There's so many great things that we can talk about. Um, so I hate to leave on, on that, leaving everyone uncertain what the answers are, but 
there's more to come and we're going to have more conversations. We're going to have you all back again. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank each of you for taking the time and effort and putting this all together, especially Nicole for really thinking this through and, and coming to us with the idea. That's how the City Club functions. Our partners and our members come to us with ideas and, um, and help us push, put together these great conversations. Kimberly, thank you for all the work that you're doing to, to harness the power of all these great institutions on the Mag Mile uh, and, and surrounding. Um, Stan, I, you know, so many, so many years and so many cycles that you have seen, and and to have your expertise is, Don't is talk incredible. About the years. <laughs> uh, Logan, thank you. Uh, please share the message that uh, with the rest of the world when you're around the world yep. that uh, about Chicago. Always. And it, it it really is great to to hear your story, and and we see so much more to come from you, Oscar, and and, and of course the, um, of course the largest Starbucks in the world. I'm hoping that there's a promotion in there for you. Um, thank you all. Uh, we're a couple minutes over, but I, I appreciate everybody's time. Come back to City Club soon. Enjoy another beautiful week in Chicago.